um, to steal a little bit of their thunder. Um, so the what I'm going to talk about today is actually the challenges in creating a power autonomous vehicle um, or the Rebel Leaf. And so yes, the vehicle looks fairly large on the screen, but if you look at the scale bar, the wingspan of this is only three centimeters. talk about the challenges associated with that today. So science fiction certainly has ideas of what they think an autonomous flying robot being looks like. One of the most common and the questions that I get most often are from Black Mirror. Um, I think Kevin and I were at a conference in China at the World Economic Forum. And I think I and this guy had just come out and every single person apparently had watched it on the plane because every question we got that day was, have we seen I in the sky? Um, so here you can see a flying beetle drone. GI Joe Retaliation had this idea of fireflies, um, which are actually pretty cool looking um, at the start. Um, a good friend of mine showed me this episode of The Flash, which had this detailed um, autonomous vehicle. And then one of the, you know, original, um, one of the original videos from 1994, Richie Rich with this Robo B, um, is a video that most people send to me regularly. And I actually do very much love this video because it shows something that, you know, I hope to one day achieve where you have the scientist who's built this incredibly complex device, but he's so confident in its operation that he hands the controls over to a child who's never been able to use this before. Um, he's able to, you know, maneuver it around the room to an extent. Yes, he does hit this. I don't have a better word for him. I guess he's a butler. Um, hit this butler who is annoyed by him and does eventually swat him to the heartbreak of the scientist and the child himself. Um, because it does take many, many hours to build these platforms. Um, but I always love watching this video. So when you think about off-the-shelf robotic platforms, things that come to mind are, you know, the KUPA arm, um, Ghost Robotics has this Minotaur from a couple of years ago. There are many examples of four-legged vehicles. Um, many people ask me, why don't I just work on quad rotors? So Crazy Fly is a really good example of an off-the-shelf platform. Cassie is a two-legged vehicle. The thing that all of these things, the thing that all these platforms have in common is that they're plug and play, they're fairly modular, and they're robust. And what I mean by that is that, you know, these can be seen in a lot of different labs used for a lot of different purposes. And so they're really bringing the field forward and thinking about, you know, various applications that can be done. When you start going down into the centimeter scale and the insect scale, uh, these micro robots are very delicate, they're tethered, and they're often specialized. So I can look at each of these uh, photographs and say exactly who is working on these platforms. Um, if you notice, each of these is tethered for power. Um, and if it's not tethered for power on board, then it's using some external magnetic actuation. Um, and they're constrained inside of laboratory environments. They're not quite plug and play. And we can't get them into every lab, every researcher who wants to answer different questions about these platforms. So I work on making these vehicles more autonomous by adding sensing control, power, and actuation. And so that uh, contains micro and mesoscale manufacturing, thinking about power storage and amplification, um, as well as looking into some custom sensors and ICs. What I hope to get out of it is once I have these platforms is um, both in my lab and external collaborators, we can start thinking about various locomotion strategies for vehicles at this scale. There's, you know, really rich questions um, when thinking about uh, how to move at this scale. Um, also thinking about collective algorithms. One of the great things about small scale robots is that they're fairly cheap. They can go into um, tight environments. And so one of the benefits is that you would want to use a lot of them. Um, they can also be used for uh, as platforms for biological study. Here, we actually just have a bee trapped inside of a straw, and we're spinning it around and around and around. This was easy. We were able to get a bee to do exactly what we wanted it to do, because we just put it to sleep and stuffed it into a tube. But a lot of times, you can't get a bee to repetitively um, perform the same task. So you'd want to use a robotic vehicle. Um, lots of interesting questions in planning and estimation. And then, of course, all of this involves some system level optimization. So 10 years ago, Pak Fong, uh, my colleague, and Kevin Ma 
um, showed the first hovering flight of one of these vehicles. So this was the RoboB then. It weighed 80 milligrams. It had a wingspan of three centimeters. It flapped at about 120 hertz. It was actuated at about 180 volts, and it had a payload capacity of about 40 milligrams. So here you can see it is hovering in place in this video. And then three years ago, at the end of my PhD, um, we were able to demonstrate the first untethered flight. And so this required an entirely new vehicle design. So this is the RoboB X-Wing. Uh, it has a mass of 90 milligrams. It is four wings, but with only two actuators. Its wingspan is the same, but it has a payload capacity of about 200 milligrams. And so I'll get into how we were able to achieve this dramatic increase. Um, it does consume about 28 milliwatts of power. Um, at the bottom, that is not a sail. It is not being used for passive stability. It's not being used specifically for passive stability. Um, that is what is taking the low voltage from the solar cells and stepping it up to the high voltage required by the piezoelectric actuators. And so what you can see in this video is as soon as the lights turn on, this is slowed down significantly 100 times, um, the vehicle is able to take off. As soon as it leaves the light source, it will just come crashing down. There is no onboard control in this video. Um, the string that you see on the top is just for safety. We don't want it to go crashing down. Um, so no power is being delivered to the vehicle. This is a really exciting moment for all of us. Uh, the thing that enables all of this work is um, the Nido scale manufacturing process that was developed in Rob Wood's lab. Um, and so what you can see here is every piece of the robot is, you know, hand designed and, and assembled. So you can see the carbon fiber pieces of the airframe in the center, the two piezoelectric um, actuators on the side, which create our um, flapping motion. We have two wings, wing hinges, a transmission that takes the motion from the piezoelectrics and creates our flapping motion. Um, the motion tracking markers, because again, we're constrained inside of you know, a one foot cube um, and a tether. So all of this is done using a laminate uh, manufacturing process. So we fabricate and pre-pattern each individual layer. We sandwich rigid, uh, sorry, we sandwich flexible material between two rigid layers. Um, and once we release it in our laser cutter, we're able to actually get, you know, a hinge or a folding motion. So that's how we get from 2D to 3D. We use piezoelectric bimors primarily because they're small and lightweight. They have high energy and power density, and they also have a wide bandwidth. Um, so you can use them anywhere from one to a thousand hertz. Um, what you see here is if you bias the one of the plates, you ground the other plate, and then you send a sinusoidal signal through the sensor, you get this synchronous motion. A lot of work has also been done in the propulsion, primarily by my colleague, um, Professor Kevin Chen. Um, and so a lot of work was done to determine how we can um, create these vortices and shed them and actually generate lift. And then everything right now is assembled um, by hand using tweezers and glue underneath a microscope. And I loved uh, doing this in grad school. I think my uh, my current graduate students are not as excited. I did love doing this. Don't <laughs> chuckle. <laughs> I, I found great joy in putting this together, but I think I'm alone in that. <laughs> um, once everything is assembled, uh, each side is independently actuated. So while we don't actually operate them at different frequencies, each side at different frequencies, we absolutely can. Um, but we are able to generate various torques, which enable the controlled flight that you saw at the start of the video. How do we do that? So by to generate pitching motion, we actually just change the mean offset of our wing so that we can pitch forward or backward. To roll, we flap one wing um, faster than the other. And then yaw, um, well, there's now an updated control strategy for yaw, but uh, it used to be split cycling control so that if you flap one wing faster on the upstroke than the downstroke, and you do the exact opposite on the other side, you'll generate a yaw, tor yaw torque to turn. So when you fly these vehicles open loop, because everything is hand assembled, they each have their own intricacies. And so we run these open loop tests until we get a straight upright flight. We've you know, taken all of the various um, uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous speeds out of it. 
uh, we wrap a, a controller around it, and so we're able to get um, this hovering flight at the end. But what you can see is that this vehicle is tethered for power and control, and also has these four motion capture markers, um, which uh, allow the external motion capture arena to report its position orientation at all times. Just for scale, this is an image of the motion capture arena that I used during my PhD work. Um, and down at the bottom in the circle is a thief. Next to it is a port, so it is quite small. If you step out even further, it's not just the arena that uh, enables all the signaling. It requires three external computers, um, high voltage amplifiers underneath, uh, and then finally the signal generator at the end. So I'll step through and highlight all of these. So first we have our motion tracking system. The position orientation then goes to our control computer, which generates the signals that gets routed to a high voltage amplifier and then finally through its other supply. So the current state in most of the videos that we see are B inside of motion capture arena. So if we actually want to take this outside, outside in the um, outside of a laboratory environment, we need to think about what sensors we're going to put on board. Um, how we're going to update our vehicle design. So are we going to scale it up? Are we going to include more wings? Um, things of that nature. And then how are we actually going to power the vehicle? And so over the course of my work, as Kevin mentioned, I focused on sensor autonomy and on power autonomy. We don't have time today to talk about all the work that I've done in sensing. And so um, I'm actually just going to talk about power autonomy today mostly because I haven't had the opportunity to speak about it in a conference before because the paper came out right before the pandemic started. So um, I'm excited to talk about it today. So when thinking about power autonomy, we want to generate actuation signals. We want to integrate an onboard power supply. We need to think about our vehicle's payload capacity. So like I said, um, when we started the project, we had a vehicle that could carry 40 milligrams. Um, that is certainly not going to allow us to take off with power. Um, and also we always need to consider what our massive power requirements are for the vehicle. So originally we did in vehicle redesign. So how do we actually increase payload just with our two in vehicle? So a colleague of mine, Noah Jaffris, um, works really hard um, on this process. And so he wanted to figure out how can he increase thrust per weight and power. So you don't want to increase the mass of the vehicle and you don't want to um, increase the power that it is going to consume um, because that also will help you when trying to create a power autonomous vehicle. So what he did was he increased actuator and transmission stiffness, which led to a very pronounced resonance. And so this created a new operating condition for the vehicle. So instead of operating at 120 Hertz before, we now operate at 170 Hertz in this vehicle. Um, but it increased our payload capacity to about 170 milligrams and our total lift is about 270. Yeah. So, in that um, diagram that I showed on a couple of slides ago, what I'm trying to replace in this system is not the controller. The controller is not yet on board, but I do want to generate the waveforms and I do want to step up that voltage. So piezoelectric actuators require a high voltage time varying signal. And so throughout the rest of this talk, Whenever you see these two gray bars, it's just another representation of piezoelectric actuators. I've just taken a cross section of the image. And so there are a couple ways of doing this. One of the most common ways is this, um, two, this dual stage topology where this first stage that you see here steps up the voltage to this uh, bias line. Um, this high voltage, the energy for the high voltage line is stored in this large high voltage capacitor. And then these transistors that you see here, QH and QL, will step up the voltage, will step up the voltage or step the voltage down as necessary to create this time varying signal. Um, and you can see a rough estimation of what the pulsing actually looks like here. So QH and QL pulse to raise and lower the voltage. And then Q is just pulsed here to keep the bias line constant. And so before we even started building this, we spec'd it out. And so just using off-the-shelf components, the estimated mass of the system was about 100 milligrams. And the estimated input power for a 28 milliwatt vehicle was about 100 milliwatts. Also thinking about what our onboard power options are. The smallest um, commercial battery that you can buy is actually only 
330 milligrams, which was grossly, um, I mean, it's five times the weight of the vehicle, it couldn't fly. Um, so we started looking into custom batteries using the same contaminant <laughs> manufacturing process. And so while some of the batteries did achieve um, pretty significant power density, one kilowatt per kilogram for about 100 milligrams of mass, um, we couldn't find a consistent process to actually um, integrate it on board the vehicle. Um, another off-the-shelf uh, strategy is photovoltaic cells. And so there are six cells that you can see uh, arranged here. Each cell weighs 10 milligrams. It has about a 30% efficiency and can generate about 10 milliwatts under one sun, each cell. So power autonomy is fairly simple. It just requires one equation, one inequality. So you want the total lift of the vehicle to be greater than the mass of the bee, the mass of the power source, and the mass of the drive stage. And you want the total power, which is your input power, to be less than the power of the source. So just doing a really quick calculation, the bee can lift 270 milligrams, its mass is 75 milligrams. Using six cells, we have 60 milligram power source and about 100 milligram drive stage that we expect. 100 milliwatts would be less than 120 milliwatts, and I'm getting the 120 milliwatt number from the six cells. If I provide two suns, 20 milliwatts a cell, 120 milliwatts total. So we actually designed this in discrete components. So the uh, this is the dual stage topology that you can see here. Unfortunately, the mass was significantly higher than what we anticipated. It uh, required about 20 additional milligrams of just input capacitance to regulate the voltage coming in from um, the source. Uh, our input power was also quite high, 150 milliwatts. And this was mostly because the microcontroller that we, uh, that we needed um, needed to pulse in very, very fine increments to keep the um, high voltage um, constant. So we were pulsing in about, you know, 100 nanosecond increments. So our clock was running incredibly fast and that was what was causing it. But overall, the topology had, you know, close to a 70% efficiency, which we were pretty proud of, um, at least in the blue stage. Um, so while we, uh, so the first thing that we did was we looked at, okay, what are our computer and a high voltage amplifier doing? Um, and as you can see here, the videos are almost completely in sync. So we knew that our topology was actually able to generate the proper signals to allow the vehicle to flap its wings. But we're 25 milligrams over our mass budget. And so how can we actually do this at lower mass? So there is a different stage, the single stage topology, um, which steps up the voltage um, at the same, so it basically creates a time varying high voltage signal all in one stage. And so this requires only two switches, um, QL and QH. And so that just, um, if, you, if you pulse QL, you raise your voltage. If you pulse QH, you begin lowering it. So if you have um, a bimorph actuator, so you have two piezoelectric plates that you have to energize, you take that single stage, you multiply it by two, and you get these um, two uh, signals that are out of phase. So unfortunately, to prevent depolling, because our uh, actuators are pulled in the same direction, VA always has to be larger than VB. So we came up with this new switching strategy where we would pulse one actuator, clamp the bottom actuator to prevent the voltage from rising, and then pulsed the second actuator and then allowed that to just follow the other. And so we ended up with this nice um, switching strategy that allowed us to pulse in a sequence. And so we actually didn't need to run any types of interrupts. We could um, slow down our clock speed significantly. And so we could actually use a, um, a much cheaper and uh, you know, lower power usage microcontroller. Um, this also required a clamp that you can see here in QS um, to prevent VB from rising above VA. So in discrete components, comparing this new single stage topology to the dual stage topology from before, you lowered our, our, out, our external power requirement from four suns to two and a half suns. You lowered our mass by about 30 milligrams. 
Our input power into the being 150 milliwatts is 110 milliwatts, and the overall efficiency increased to 25%. And so we were um, very encouraged by these numbers, put everything on board the vehicle and tried to take off. This is also just looking at our waveform analysis. So while there is significant stair stepping on the first um, pulse down, that can be um, improved with um, higher resolution clock, but we didn't actually need it. Um, because the harmonics are very well matched to the idealized waveform. So we put everything on board the vehicle. Uh, the rod that you see sticking out from the view is actually because it uh, had a very large pitch problem and we couldn't figure out how to do it um, or how to fix it besides adding this mask. And so we stared at this video, I want to say for hours, because as you can see here, it starts taking off, okay? And it takes off a little bit. We were like, this isn't convincing. People won't believe us when we say that we, if, you know, we're able to achieve untethered flight. We wanted to get, you know, significant body lengths off the ground. Um, so I went to my colleague Noah, who was designing the vehicle, and it said, "We need a new vehicle. I've done everything I can with the electronics. You know, I've shaved 30 milligrams from here. It's time to think about a new vehicle design." So that's where we came up with the rope of the X-wing. So our new actuator design increased force. Um, the base is now made of alumina and this clamped um, the bottom of the actuator and this allowed us to better distribute force to the tip. But whenever you increase force, there's a linear relationship between force and power. And so what we had to do was decrease our wing velocity. One way of doing this is just to go from a two wing vehicle to a four wing vehicle. And that's what you can see here. And so what is happening is um, the wings do not have to travel through the same um, distance and thus you are lowering your velocity. So here, um, the mass of this vehicle is a little bit heavier due to um, all of the uh, additional mechanisms necessary to clamp everything together. The two wings are fixed to each other on each side, so they do not change angle um, during flight. Um, the uh, power load uh, stayed exactly the same. It was 28 milliwatts of real power, 50 milliwatts of reactive power, but we increased our total lift from 270 milligrams to 325 milligrams, um, and we increased our payload capacity to 215, um, keeping uh, the actuation signal fairly constant. So the reason why everything is so splayed out here is we didn't want there to be any type of aerodynamic effects um, close to the wing, and so we raised the solar array quite far from the vehicle itself. In order to balance the center of pressure and the center of mass, we placed the signal generator um, below the vehicle and allowed it to stay in the center. And so this would give us some past stability if we were just taking off. So this is the same video that I showed at the beginning with um, all these improvements in real time. It just looked like that. The first time it took off, I wasn't convinced that it had taken off. I was in charge of turning the lights on um, above it. And I thought that it had hit me. And I remember freaking out um, to Noah, uh, who was standing controlling the camera at the time. And I was like, it hit me and I broke it. Um, but luckily nothing happened. We were able to get a couple of these repeated flights. And um, now that this has slowed down, we could really see that we were generating significant amounts of lift, um, more lift than you know what is necessary here um, to take off. And we have this really convincing uh, video of the first autonomous flight of a vehicle of this size, which we were um, very, very excited about. I don't remember if you were there that day, Kevin. I was there. I Kevin was, was there that day. He was also excited. <laughs> I've written him out of my memories. <laughs> um, uh, as Kevin mentioned, this ended up on the cover of Nature. Uh, with the title Flying Solo. I was very excited um, that Disney decided not to sue us um, with Robo B X-Wing as one Star Wars reference and then Flying Solo as like an illusion to Han Solo as a second reference. And I remember going to Nature saying, I'm very afraid of Disney. And they were like, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, they turned out to be correct, but I was still afraid. <laughs> But there was the first untethered flight of an insect scale micro robot. The total mass was about 259 milligrams. The input power um, was somewhere between two and a half and three suns. And we demonstrated passive stability to get you know, the 
the takeoff. Um, so just to like wrap up in, in this area, uh, I'm super excited about all the potential that can come out of this, both in terms of, uh, you know, an autonomous, you know, RoboBee, uh, but also some of the technology fallout that has come out of some of this work, specifically in endoscopic procedures and medical devices, um, specifically with, you know, wearables and wearable sensing. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how we're going to think about the integration of electronics into that and the interface between soft to rigid components. Um, and then looking to biology for interesting inspiration. So this is, you know, a collective of weaver ants. They are able to build bridges out of their own bodies. And so thinking about new mechanisms uh, that are able to attach and detach and, you know, create a robot that is, or multiple robots that are better than the sum of its parts. Um, these things are also really great platforms to get kids and others interested in science. And so this is another thing that I'm super passionate about um, as evidenced by all the work that I've uh, done in this area. Um, and with that, I will take any of your questions. Thank you. Okay, you're in charge of the chat. Yeah, I didn't see. Any questions? So any questions? Yeah, yeah I think you yes, can please. use the mic. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just so the people online can hear you. Yeah. So I was wondering, you mentioned your first iteration of the Beaver robot was tethered for power and control and you had the arena of motion tracking. Sure. When it was flying, those different flying flight patterns you had, were those based off of feedback from the motion control arena, or were they pre programmed, or did someone have a controller on the computer and they were um, using to fly it? So there was a controller on the computer. It was a pre planned trajectory um, in all of the flights. So we either told it to hover or we told it to move side to side. I mean, Pak Fong was the expert at the time. Um, but then a real-time controller was taking the position orientation information in real time and then adjusting the control signals uh, that way. Do you think you're anywhere near having one of these, like the first video you showed with the controller going to fly around the room? I mean, I really hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's a goal. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that it was important that you were operating at like a higher frequency of resonance. Yeah. How important is that to, you know, the, the trade off of being able to get it on lift? But then what do you think the implications are for like being able to control some connections? Yeah. So that's actually a really interesting question. So some of the work that's been done in the lab since I've left has specifically been looking at, you know, heading control and, um, and yaw control specifically. Um, and so to do that, the problem with the split cycling is it's a second order signal and that gets filtered through our transmission system. And so what they found is that you actually have to operate away from resonance in order to get that type of heading control. Um, and so it's something that, you know, we've been looking at the trade-offs between, you know, how much power are we actually going to consume away from resonance operating at, you know, either a higher frequency or a higher voltage, lower frequency. Um, to do that. And so, yeah, it's something that we're actively looking into. Absolutely. Yeah. A quick question. Yeah. Um, when you do roll pitch and yaw, yes. do you get secondary effects as well? So like, if you roll, do you get a little bit of um, like pitching as well, or is it decoupled? They're fairly decoupled. Yeah, I, I, I haven't noticed real significant um, effects of pitching when I'm intending to roll. Yeah, no, good question. So first of all, thank you for your talk. Yeah. It was very interesting. Thank you. So obviously, this work was primarily based on the flight yeah. the representation of the bee, for example. Now, the bee itself is obviously of the hexapetal animal, which means that it also uses its legs to move forward. Yeah. So what I would be interested in in this case is if there is, um, yeah, 
So if there would be any problems in translating these, uh, these weight requirements to leg gate patterns, for example, for mm -hmm. small scale robots. Yeah. So I've worked, we've worked on terrestrial, I've worked on terrestrial platforms in the past. They use the same type of actuation strategy and the same type of uh, signal generation. Um, it does consume a little bit more power, but because it's so low, sorry, there are more actuators. It actually consumes a similar amount of power because they're operating at such low frequencies and low voltages. Um, but actually getting a vehicle of that size to like, fly and take off is um, a little bit of a challenge. I do know that other people in this area have thought about just using like vibrating motion to get across, it's kind of like a press of thought almost. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. I just felt that it might be a bit more difficult to also integrate controlling a, a grounded uh, robot in that case because it's just such a complicated mechanism. That yeah. Know. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a very interesting question. Okay, okay and you. with that, we're currently out of time, and so Pak Fong will introduce our next speaker. Oh. Oh. Set up. So the next speaker.